At the age of 16, I happened into Eileen's house in much the same way Dorothy Gale happened into Oz. I woke up there. I had no idea where I was, only that I had a terrible hangover and was staring up into a crystal chandelier in a room that smelled strongly of spilled vodka. That day I hung out in the kitchen, sipping mimosas and listening to one of Eileen's daughter's accounts of her recent chin job. I never knew precisely what it was that Eileen did, although she had a lot of money, which she probably came into a la Jaja Gabor by marrying and divorcing quite well. Eileen had been married about five times, somewhere along the line to either the son of the cowardly lion, the tin woodsman, or the scarecrow. I forget which one. She owned a huge 1920s stucco mansion nestled into the flats of Beverly Hills, and it was here that she lived with her two sullen teenage daughters, a black maid in a gray uniform straight out of Mildred Pierce, and an ever-changing cast of thousands. Eileen, for all her salon appointments and country club activities, had a weak spot in her heart for misfits, and she picked up and harbored every stray in Hollywood. There were usually five or six large dogs who had the run of the place, and equally as many cats. A chihuahua with a heart condition, a few 17-year-old Midwestern hustlers, a displaced Swedish model with no English skills, and an alcoholic uncle who doddered around in a silk dressing gown, hiding fifths of scotch. Eileen's favorite, though, was the blonde, blue-eyed Mexican gay roller derby star from Pacoima, kicked off the L.A.T. Bird's bench for a broken ankle. He was in recovery at Eileen's and having sex with everything that came through the door. There were quite a few nubile glam rock groupies, and I suppose it was into this category that I fit. Eileen's brother was an obliging quack, so everyone in the house had a script for Valium, and they were all reading Play It As It Lays. No one actually worked, but they were all expected to pitch in and help out, like making runs to Smart and Final for wholesale booze and bulk dog food, or at least changing the sheets in the guest rooms. I ain't touching those, the maid would sniff, her eyes glued to General Hospital. It was always a big event when a sightseeing bus would pull up in front of the house and everyone that was in the living room would run out and moon it. At night, we'd all go dancing at places like Gino's 2 or the other side and spend the next day cattily rehashing the previous night's scandals. I began cutting school in the afternoons to witness the goings-on. It was exciting stuff for a 16-year-old. Everything from an aging drag queen getting into a fist fight with the roto rooter man to someone stealing somebody else's private drug stash. Pretending I'd seen it all before, I got the education of a lifetime in degeneracy. I mean, Jacqueline Suzanne couldn't come close. With the advent of punk rock, though, I began drifting out of that scene, and the places I was frequenting were far too day class A for the crowded Eileen's. Occasionally I bump into someone from those days or hear scattered tidbits through the grapevine. The last I heard was that the maid had stolen an emerald ring and run off to Tahoe with the gay roller derby star who'd finally gone straight. And as if that wasn't enough, to add insult to injury, on that very same day, a mongrel puppy fresh from the pound had somehow gotten a hold of and chewed to shreds. Eileen's pair of the ruby slippers.